Chapter 31 After the students had recited their Bible verses, and before classes began, I told them that there would be no recess period for them today, and that I would let them go home for dinner at 11 o'clock because I wanted them all back at school no later than a quarter to 12. I told them that at exactly 12 o'clock they would all get down on their knees and remain on their knees until I heard from the courthouse, whether that took an hour, an hour and a half, or three hours. Lewis Washington Jr. stuck up a grimy little hand. Suppose somebody got to be excused. Then he'll make up the time on his knees after three o'clock, I told him. For every minute that you don't spend on your knees between 12 o'clock and until the time I hear from that courthouse, you will spend twice that time on your knees after three. Any other questions? No, nah, sir. Does anyone else have a question? No one did. All right, open those books. I want si and I want silence, and I mean silence. I assigned Odessa Freeman primer and first graders. Irene Cole would teach second and third. Fourth graders open their books to English grammar. Fifth graders geography. Sixth grade history. I told them I would test them later. If not this afternoon, then definitely tomorrow morning. I knew I would not be able to concentrate on teaching this morning, so I got my Westcott ruler and went outside. It was a nice day, blue sky, not a cloud. Across the road in the Freeman's yard, I could see a path of white lilies on either side of the walk that led up to the porch. An old automobile tire surrounded each flower. Behind the house was a sugar cane field. The new cane was about waist high to the average man walking between the rows. Somewhere across the field, I could hear the sound of a tractor. A white sharecropper must have been plowing the ground since no colored people were working today. Even those who worked up at the big house for Henry P. Show or for the other white people along the river had taken the day off. This had been discussed and agreed at church last Sunday. Those who were not at church were told that the others decided that he, Jefferson, should have all their respect this one day. Now, except for the sound of the tractor back in the field, the rest of the plantation was quiet. No one sat out on the porch. No one worked in the garden. No one walked across the yard or in the road. I looked towards Miss Emma's house farther down the quarter. My aunt was there. Others were there, but they were all inside. The front door was shut, though the window was open to let in fresh air. I could see the white gauze curtain hanging limp in the window. I went around to the back of the church. Like so many country churches, it was wood framed, long and narrow, with a corrugated tin roof and a bell tower. Years ago, I was told the church sat flat on the ground. Later, it was set up on wooden blocks. During the 30s, when I was a student here, the wooden blocks, which had rotted over the years, were replaced by bricks. A year or two before I started teaching, Farrell Jarrow and a couple of other men removed the bricks and put in cement blocks. But now even the cement blocks had sunk low into the ground so low into the ground that a child losing a marble or ball under the church had a hard time crawling under there to retrieve it. I remember playing ragball back there, the other children and I using our fists as bats. We all tried to hit the ball out of the yard for a home run. I suppose I had done so many times, as many times as anyone else, but the number of times was nothing to brag about. Where were all the others now? Most had gone to southern cities, to northern cities, others to the grave. Had Jefferson ever hit a home run? He was as big as anyone else, stronger than most, but to hit a home run off a rag ball was a feat. Brute strength was not enough. Timing and luck were needed. You had to hit it just right and that took timing and luck. Lily Green had hit as many as anyone else, I suppose, but her luck ran out before she was 20. Killed accidentally in a bar room in Baton Rouge. 
What a waste. Such a beautiful girl. All the boys loved Lily Green. I started back toward the front. What about tomorrow? What happens after today? Nothing will ever be the same after today. At five minutes to 11, I was standing at my desk facing the open front door when I saw the minister's car go up the quarter with Harry Williams sitting in the passenger seat beside him. They were on their way into Bayon. I told my students to put away their things quietly. Before letting them go, I reminded them that I didn't want any running or loud talking and that I wanted them all back at school no later than a quarter to 12. When they had all gone, I sat down at my desk facing the door. I did not want to think. I wanted to sit there until I heard, but not to think before then. No, I wanted to go to my car and drive away, to go somewhere and lose all memory of where I had come from. I wanted to go. I wanted to, God, what does a person do who knows there's only one more hour to live? I felt like crying but I refused to cry. No, I would not cry. There were too many more who would end up as he did. I could not cry for all of them, could I? I wished I could telephone Vivian, but there was not one telephone, public or otherwise, between here and Bayon that I could use. I would see her tonight, though. I would definitely see her tonight. I need to see you tonight, my love. But who was with him? Who is with you, Jefferson? Is he with you, Jefferson? He is with Reverend Ambrose because Reverend Ambrose believes. Do you believe, Jefferson? Have I done anything to make you not believe? If I have, please forgive me for being a fool. For at this moment, what else is there? I know now that that old man is much braver than I. I am not with you at this moment because, because I would not have been able to stand. I would not have been able to walk with you those last few steps. I would have embarrassed you, but the old man will not. He will be strong. He is going to use their God to give him strength. You just watch Jefferson. You just watch. He is brave, braver than I, braver than any of them, except you, I hope. My faith is in you, Jefferson. The children returned from dinner as I had asked them to do, and at 10 minutes to 12, I lined them up before the door. When the last one had marched into the church, I went to my desk to face them. In a couple of minutes, it will be 12 o'clock. I will ask you to get down on your knees and to remain on your knees until I ask you to get up. Are there any questions? Lewis Washington Jr. raised that grimy little hand again. Is you going to bow down too, Mr. Wiggins? The proper way to ask that question is, are you going to bow down too, Mr. Wiggins? You going bow down too? I'll be outside, I told the class. Irene, you, Odessa, and Clarence are in charge. All right, please, on your knees. I'll tell you when to get up. We need to pray, Lewis Washington Jr. wanted to know. Yes, I told him, but quietly to yourself. Several of the larger girls knelt on scarves or handkerchiefs. I took up my Westcott and went out through the front door. I had no idea what I would do while I waited to hear from Bayon, but I found myself out in the road walking up and down the quarter. It was a couple of minutes after 12, and I was trying not to think. But how could I not think about something that had dominated my thoughts for nearly six months? It seemed that I had spent more time with him in that jail cell than I had with the children at the church school. Where was he at this very moment? At the window, looking out at the sky, lying on the bunk, staring at the gray ceiling, standing at the cell door, waiting? How did he feel? Was he afraid? Was he crying? Were they coming to get him now, this moment? Was he on his knees, begging for one more minute of life? Was he standing? Why wasn't I there? Why wasn't I standing beside him? Why wasn't my arm around him? Why? Why wasn't I back there with the children? 
Why wasn't I down on my knees? Why? At the mouth of the quarter, there was a shade from the pecan tree in the corner of the fence surrounding Henry Pichot's yard. A shallow ditch ran, ran between the fence and the road. The people from the quarter had sat under that tree as far back as I could remember. Men had gambled there with cards and dice. Others had stood or sat there to get out of the hot sun or the rain. Before I had a car, I had stood there many times waiting for the bus. The bus driver always blew the horn about a mile before he got there, and I would have time to cross the highway to wave it down. There would always be someone there, but today I sat alone. Behind me was Henry Pichot's gray and white antebellum house, sitting on its foundation high above the ground. His car was parked on the grass in the front yard. I figured that he would be the first to hear, and maybe he would come into the quarter. I looked back over my shoulder when I sat down, and I looked back every minute or two afterward. It must have been 12.15 by now. I didn't want to look at my watch anymore. Had it already happened, or was he still waiting, sitting on the bunk, hands clasped together, waiting? Was he standing at the cell door, listening for the first sound of footsteps coming toward him? Or was it finally, finally over? Don't tell me to believe. Don't ma tell me to believe in the same God or laws that men believe in who commit these murders. Don't tell me to believe that God can bless this country and that men are judged by their peers. Who among his peers judged him? Was I there? Was the minister there? Was Hen Harry Williams there? Was Farrell Jarrow? Was my aunt? Was Vivian? No, his peers did not judge him, and I will not believe. Yet they must believe. They must believe, if only to free the mind, if not the body. Only when the mind is free has the body a chance to be free. Yes, they must believe. They must believe because I know what it means to be a slave. I am a slave. I looked back, but there was no movement at Henry Pichot's house. It must have been close to 1230, but I refused to look at my watch. Several feet away from where I sat under the tree was a hill of bull grass. I doubted that I had looked at it w once in all the time I had been sitting there. I probably would not have noticed it at all, had a butterfly, a yellow butterfly with dark specks like ink dots on its wings, not lit there. What had brought it there? There was no odor that I could detect to have attracted it. There were other places where it could have rested. There was a wire fence on either side of the road. There were weeds along both ditches with strong fragrances and there were flowers just a short distance away in Pichot's yard. So why did it light on a hill of bull grass that offered it nothing? I watched it closely, the way it opened its wings and closed them, the way it opened its wings again, fluttered and closed its wings for a second or two, then opened them again and flew away. I watched it fly over the ditch and down into the quarter. I watched until I could not see it anymore. Yes, I told myself, it is finally over. I waited another few minutes for Henry Pichot to come out, but he did not. I stood up and stretched and looked across the highway at the river. So tranquil, its waters, its water as blue as the sky. The willows near the edge of the water were just as still, and no breeze stirred the, sta the Spanish moss that hung in the cypresses. I could hear the horn of the bus. I, I could hear the horn of the bus as the bus came around the big bend a mile away on its way into Bayonne. I looked toward Pichot's house again and I started back down the quarter. I knew it was over, but I would wait until I heard from the courthouse. I looked back several times, but no Henry Pichot. I was the only person in the road. Just me and my gray par car parked farther down the quarter in front of my aunt's house. 
I took my time and occasionally slapped my leg with the Westcott. When I came up even with the church, I stopped them out in the road to look at Miss Emma's house. The door was still shut. The curtain hung limp in the window. I wondered if she knew it was finally over. Just before going into the churchyard, I looked back up at the quarter, and now I did see a car coming toward me. The driver drove slowly to keep... The driver drove slowly to keep down the dust. It didn't look like Pichot's car, and I knew it was not Reverend Ambrose's. I moved into the ditch as Paul came up even with me and stopped. We looked at each other, and I knew he had come to bring me the news. I didn't go up to the car as I was supposed to do. I waited for him to make his move. I saw him reach for something on the seat beside him. Then he opened the door and got out. He had a notebook, just like the one I had given Jefferson. I waited for him to come to me. He wanted me to bring you this. Paul looked directly at me, his gray-blue eyes more intense than I had ever seen them before. I took the notebook from him, and he continued to stare at me like someone in shock. Do you have a minute? he asked me. Yes, but I'll go inside first. I left the children on their knees. I'll be right back. The children all looked at me as I walked up the aisle to the table. I told them to rise from their knees. When they had all sat down, some of them rubbing their knees before sitting, I told them that I had to speak to someone and I wanted them to remain quiet until I got back. I told them that Jefferson had sent a notebook to me and I was going to leave it on the table and later we would talk. I left Irene Cole in charge and went back outside. Paul and I started walking down the quarter. We were both quiet. I waited for him to begin. It went as well as it could have gone. He spoke slowly as we walked abreast, looking up ahead. He looking up ahead, I looking at the ground. There was no trouble. He was a little shaky, but no trouble. Paul was quiet a moment. He suddenly stopped walking. After going another step, I stopped too and looked back at him. He was the strongest man in that crowded room, Grant Wiggins, Paul said, staring at me and speaking louder than was necessary. He was, he was. I'm not saying this to make you feel good, I'm not saying this to ease your pain. Ask the preacher, ask that preacher, ask Harry Williams. He was the strongest man there. We all stood jammed together, no more than six, eight feet away from that chair. We all had each other to lean on. When Vincent asked him if he had any last words, he looked at that he looked at the preacher and said, Tell Nana and I walked. And straight he walked, Grant Wiggins. Straight he walked. I'm a witness. Straight he walked. Paul stopped talking. He was breathing heavily. He was looking at me, but seeing Jefferson in that chair. We started walking again. We were passing by Miss Emma's house, but Paul didn't know this. He had never been in the quarter before. After they put the death cloth over his face, I couldn't watch anymore. I looked down at the floor, Paul was saying. His voice was quieter, less intense now. I heard the two jolts, but I wouldn't look up. I'll never forget the sound of that generator as long as I live on this earth. We came to the end of the corridor and stood on the railroad tracks while gazing across the field at the rows of early cane. Paul got in front of me to look in my face. You're one great teacher, Grant Wiggins, he said. I'm not great. I'm not even a teacher. Why do you say that? You have to believe to be a teacher, I said, looking at the rows of new cane. To the right of where we were standing were the tall pecan trees in the cemetery. There would be another grave there in a day or two. I saw the transformation, Grant Wiggins. 
Paul said, I didn't do it. Who then? Maybe he did it himself. He never could have done that. I saw the transformation. I'm a witness to that. Then maybe it was God, I said. Paul continued to look at me. He did not like the way I had used the name of God. He had come from good stock. He believed, but he didn't say anything. You ready to start back, I asked him. I didn't open his notebook, Paul said. We had turned and were walking up the corridor now. I didn't think it was my place to open the notebook. He asked me to bring it to you, and I brought it to you. But I would like to know his thoughts sometime, if you don't mind. After I read it, I said, I suppose this has been very hard on everybody. Hard on the people here, I said. School is just about ready to end, huh? Paul asked after a while. Yes, I said, we start a month later and get out two months earlier than the whites do. What are you going to do when school is over? Go on a vacation? I don't know. It depends on Vivian. Whatever she wants. She's beautiful, Paul said. You're a lucky fellow there, Grant Wiggins. Yes, I'm lucky, I said. Some of us are. I'm sorry, Paul said. I'm very, very sorry. We had stopped for a moment. Now we started walking again. If I could ever be of any help, I would like you to call on me. I mean that with all my heart. We were passing by Miss Emma's house. Reverend Ambrose's car was parked before the door. Isn't that the preacher's car? Paul asked. That's where Jefferson lived. That's his Nanan's house. Paul looked at the house as we went by. He looked at it again over his shoulder. We came up to the church and stopped at his car. Well, I better go into the children, I said. Paul stuck out his hand. Allow me to be your friend, Grant Wiggins. I don't ever want to forget this day. I don't ever want to forget him. I took his hand. He held mine with both of his. I don't know what you're going to say when you go back in there, but tell them that he was the bravest man in that room today. I'm a witness, Grant Wiggins. Tell them so. Maybe one day you will come back and tell them so. It would be an honor. I turned from him and went into the church. Irene Cole told the class to rise with their shoulders back. I went up to the desk and turned to face them. I was crying. The end.